So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the program on Africana and Latin American Studies and the Department of Sociology and Anthropology are so pleased to welcome you all to today's talk, the post-racial nation, uh, black slavery, fair racism, and the changing American population. So in thinking about the Colgate community, we're bound together by the 13 goals of a Colgate education, and I think that this talk is particularly relevant to three of those goals. First, this talks the interrogation of the popular claim that we have reached a post-racial nation helps us to further our understanding of social institutions and social relations. Second, this talks appreciation for the demographic changes that face the present and future of this country help to situate us in both a global and historical perspective. Finally, this talks attention to the evolution and persistence of racial animosity helps call us to be engaged citizens seeking social justice. Today's speaker, Professor Lawrence D. Bobo, is the W.E.B. Du Bois Professor of the Social Sciences at Harvard University. Professor Bobo has dedicated his career to the study of inequality, politics, and race. Some of his most noteworthy achievements include being a founding editor of the Du Bois Review, a social science research on race, co-authorship of Racial Attitudes in America, Trends and Interpretations, and authorship of Prejudice and Politics, Group Position, Public Opinion, and the Wisconsin Treaty Rights Dispute. His work has resulted in his elected membership to the National Academy of Science and his fellowship in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. I look forward to learning from his expertise in his talk today, and I look forward to learning from all of you as you stay and participate in the question and answer session that will follow his formal remarks. Please join me in welcoming Professor Lawrence Bobo to Colgate. Thank you so much. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you uh, for coming out to, to joining us and uh, taking part in this uh, set of remarks I'm going to make shortly. I, I do absolutely wish to express my personal and heartfelt thanks to the Afrikaner and Latin American Studies Program, to the Sociology and Anthropology Department, SOCHAN, I gather, which is magnificent. And I especially want to congratulate all of you and Colgate for having had the deep, deep wisdom to bring uh, Professor Alicia Simmons here because she is a quite uh, remarkable scholar and jewel and is adding so much to this community and to the larger scholarly world. So thank you. <laughs> um, but um, let me begin. Uh, Americans want to be done with race in the worst sort of way. White Americans are variously disinterested, hopeful, anxious, or resentful, or embody a frustrated mix of all of these emotions when faced with claims that race still must demand their attention in the 21st century. Black Americans ardently dream of a time when color and the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow will have no unwelcome consequences for the fabric of their lives. Latinos, Asians, and Native Americans, as well as a range of new immigrants, look on in curiosity and bewilderment at the seeming tenacity of the black-white divide and grow weary of claims about its enduring primacy. In short, Americans across the board are sick and tired of race talk. It is little surprise that in recent years, a potent narrative of the arrival of the post-racial moment has spread and taken root. From newspaper headlines and magazine covers, to major research publications and books, to our everyday discourse and common sense assumptions, America is increasingly said to have finally moved beyond race. Accordingly, racism and discrimination against blacks in particular, while perhaps not yet completely eliminated, are of such a quantitatively lower frequency and qualitatively weaker and diminishing kind that we no longer prioritize these issues. The new narrative goes even farther, in fact, holding that the basic ideas, categories, and identities that once gave race its meaning are breaking down, and doing so at an astonishing rate. To wit, if not already genuinely post-racial, America certainly stands at the bright dawn of becoming a truly post-racial nation. The problem here is that America is far from done with race or racism. We have not come far enough 
nor is the progress we have achieved sure enough to now relax and say that we need do no more. To my mind, the post-racial narrative is actually a troubling, troublesome development. It's a salve, a balm, indeed a narcotic, that gently lulls us into seeing things that are not yet there, assuming things that are not entirely true, and behaving in ways that put further and necessary progress in race relations in real jeopardy. This narrative says we are either on a steady and strong trajectory to complete the work of full racial inclusion for African Americans in the American mainstream, or that we have, save for the failings of some segments of the black population itself, really already arrived at a point where race is irrelevant to why some succeed and some fail, why some win and some lose, and why some are held in high esteem and others dwell under the burden of stigma. I am troubled by the logic of this analysis and see it as doing real harm. Now I recognize these are strong claims to make. After all, it is uncontestably true that America today is not as starkly riven by race as it was nearly six decades ago when the Supreme Court issued the landmark Brown versus Board of Education decision. The separate but equal doctrine has been legally dethroned. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 established nationwide uh, and in an uncontestably meaningful way the basic citizenship rights of African Americans. These elements of what historians know as the Second Reconstruction Era, as well as the spread of affirmative action policies and practices, resulted in a great expansion in the size, affluence, and influence of a black middle class. And of course, we have an African-American attorney general, have had two African-American secretaries of state, and currently an African-American family is proudly in residence at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue in our nation's capital. For all of these reasons and more, the post-racial narrative has risen to prominence. But careful students of the racial divide in America are uncomfortable with this narrative, in its full sweep anyway. This afternoon, I'm going to share with you the opening chapter of a book I am writing entitled Post-Racial Nation, Blacks, Laissez-Faire Racism in a Changing America. My tasks are threefold here. First, to make the case that the post-racial narrative really is the new hegemonic notion with regard to race in America. To do that, I will focus on its rise, some evidence regarding that. Speaking in particular to what the term means and why it matters, it's got different flavors or versions. This is the largest part of the talk. Uh, second, I will sketch a prima facie case for why post-racialism as a characterization of our times fails, at least from a sociological point of view. Thirdly and more briefly, I'll summarize the largest structure and argument of the book. Where are we here? Oops. Where am I? This is the wrong presentation. <laughs> Let's show you guys the right presentation. Yeah. Let's do the one I came here to do. How's that? I won't read all that again. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, post-racialism is a new American master narrative. Exactly when and where it started or when it became dominant is hard to fix. Consider this cover of Time Magazine from November 1993. It features an attractive computer-generated image of a woman. To quote from the cover itself, take a good look at this woman. She was created by a computer from a mix of several races. What you see is a remarkable picture of, quote, the new face of America, how immigrants are shaping the world's first multicultural society. The discourse of post-racialism, of course, was given a terrific boost in 2007 and 2008 by the presidential candidacy of then-Senator Barack Obama. Indeed, his successful election in 2008 and now re-election last year are exhibit number one in the case for post-racialism. Any number of headlines advance the theme. Uh, writer Charles Johnson penned an essay uh, on, quote, the end of the black uh, American narrative where he really did not intend the question mark, if you read it carefully. Uh, the New York Times ran a cover story by reporter Matt Bai on Obama and the end of black politics. Again, not really intending the question mark. New Yorker editor David Remnick wrote a piece on the Joshua generation, race in the Obama campaign. 
amplifying on a theme sometimes touched upon by Obama himself. Remnick uh, talked of the youth who animated the 2008 Obama campaign as, quote, the Joshua genera generation, a young vanguard ready to cross the great racial divide or River Jordan and get to the other side in this journey, one that previous generations had failed to succeed at doing. Uh, an editorial in the New York Times by science writer John Tierney just days before the 2008 uh, election challenged and debunked all of the research on unconscious racial bias by asking, where have all the bigots gone? <laughs> America stands just a couple days from electing an African-American president. How could all the talk of deep psychological anti-black bias actually be true? And writer Su Hua argued on the pages of The Atlantic that we are in fact witnessing even the end of white America as well. Now, a great many black public intellectuals have advanced a similar message. Um, one time, uh, civil rights lawyer Deborah Dickerson penned a book with the bold titled The End of Blackness. Stanford law professor Richard Thompson Ford argued that blacks need to be wary of playing the race card uh, too much in a much improved America. Washington Post senior editor Eugene Robinson wrote of the growing internal complexity, dispersion, and diversification internally of black America. Newsweek uh, journalist and author two decades ago of the rage of the privileged class, Ellis Coase declares in his newest book, The End of Anger, and public intellectual Touré challenged us to consider the question, who is afraid of post-blackness, giving up on the idea of a uniform, uh, integrated, authentic sense of blackness. Now, a much more direct and arguably flavorful formulation of the argument comes from uh, linguist turned black neoconservative essayist, uh, John McWhorter, uh, who writes, in a Forbes magazine piece written shortly before Obama's inauguration in 2009. So, in answer to the question, is America past racism against black people? I say yes. Of course, nothing magically changed when Obama was declared president-elect. However, our proper concern is not whether racism still exists, but whether it remains a serious problem. The election of Obama proved, as nothing else could have, that it no longer does. Well, a number of years prior to this assertion, a less ideologically committed observer, black commentator and cultural critic Stanley Crouch wrote in the New York Times Magazine in 1996 that race was generally losing its meaning. Uh, even though error, chance, and ambition are at the nub of the human future, I am fairly certain, he declared, that race as we currently obsess over it will cease to mean as much 100 years from today. What such people will look like is beyond my imagination. Perhaps uh, as Time Magazine and certainly uh, Su Hua what might have called it in his Atlantic Monthly article, beigeification. But the sweep of body types, combinations of facial features, hair textures, eye colors, and what are now unexpected skin tones will be far more common, primarily because the current paranoia over mixed marriages should by then be largely a superstition of the past. Now, to these public intellectual discourses, we can add widespread press attention, uh, I'll skip that, to a variety of uh, empirical findings that also, at bottom, advance the post-racial narrative. Consider, for example, uh, the national headlines, um, headline-worthy coverage of a report from the Manhattan Institute by my Harvard colleague and economist, uh, Edward Glazer and Jacob Vigdor who declared the end of the segregation century, right? That residential segregation was breaking down. Likewise, in 2011, the Pew Center issued a major report trumpeting the rise in mixed racial marriages, yet another sign of the end of race and racial division. And with seeming relentless further, the New York Times continues to report on the mark more than one box option on the 2000 and 2010 census forms with regard to race, particularly emphasizing that youth have abandoned uh, the old racial categories and how they think about themselves and others. In this kind of environment, I think one would have to conclude that public opinion is not immune to this drumbeat discourse and claims. How could it be? Consider two sets of results from the general social surveys 
uh, sociologists' main biannual gauge of uh, mass public opinion. When asked if racial discrimination is an important cause of black-white socioeconomic inequality, recent um, trends reveal clear patterns. First, both black and white Americans in these national surveys are less likely to attribute racial inequality to discrimination than in the past. Second, the black-white gap narrows by a third, going from a 37 percentage point gap to a 29 percentage point gap. Perhaps even more unexpectedly, when asked if lack of motivation and willpower is an important source of black-white inequality, a falling percentage of whites endorse this view, whereas a rising percentage of blacks do. So much so that nearly half of African Americans in 2008 endorsed this perspective, taking the black-white gap from 28 percentage points in 1977 to just six in 2008. All right. So Bill Cosby's winning this argument for black America. Um, let's pose the more pointed question and ask people directly if America is now beyond race. I have done so in surveys in both 2000 and after Obama's inauguration in 2009. Both blacks and whites show sweeping movement towards saying that, quote, we have already achieved or will soon achieve racial equality. The black-white gap here is still large, some 30 percentage points at the last measurement, and not shown here in these figures is the remaining large percentage of blacks who expect that we will never achieve uh, racial equality, more than one in 10. Yet the trend here, I think, is substantial and clear. Yes, the post-racial narrative is, I submit, now in ascendance. But this does not mean it is a single straightforward idea. Uh, it will help to bring a little clarity to how we should think about this term. And let me begin by um, talking about a sort of casual and uncontroversial use of the term, or what I call aspirational post-racialism. This is the least disputed form of it, and it really is merely intended to signal a hopeful trajectory for events and trends in the nation's future, not to define an accomplished fact or set of facts about social life. It is something toward which we as a nation still strive and remain guardedly hopeful about fully achieving. There are, however, um, three variants of um, the post-racial narrative that I regard as more debatable. The first of these can be labeled as, quote, the end of the black victimology narrative. Charles Johnson's essay, which I mentioned earlier, is an exemplar of this camp, as is John McWhorter's widely debated book, Losing the Race, and Shelby steals the content of our character, and to a degree, Richard Thompson's forward race card. The bottom line from all these books, stop the whining. Race is just not that important an impediment anymore. If you got to work, pulled yourself up by your bootstraps, and just worked at it, we'd be beyond most of this problem. The second debatable variant I call uh, the blurring the boundaries argument, or the beigeification of America thesis. Thanks to Sir Hua and many others for advancing the idea that, in effect, the level and pace of change in the demographic makeup and the identity choices and politics of Americans are rendering the traditional black-white divide irrelevant. Accordingly, Americans increasingly uh, revere mixture and hybridity and are rushing to embrace a decidedly beige view of themselves and what is good for the body politic. Then, of course, there is the ultimate post-racial argument uh, that we are truly beyond race. To wit, American society, or at least a large and steadily growing fraction of it, has generally pushed beyond it. So much so that we as a nation are now ready to transcend the disabling racial divisions of the past. The logic of a string of recent Supreme Court rulings, to me, seems to insist, in fact, upon just this sort of view. Um, now, as scholars, I think we need to try to set some explicit criteria about what would really constitute evidence, indeed strong evidence, for a post-racial claim. And as a sociologist, there, there are three types of, of evidence that I would like to demand or set as criteria. First, that we would live in a world where we found no significant connection between racial identity and material standard of living or place in the economy that it didn't have this consequence. Uh, in case you weren't looking, we ain't there yet. Um, second, 
no significant connection between racial identity and political standing, such as treatment by the state and in the eyes of the law. Again, uh, you can make the case that uh, we ain't quite closed that gap yet either. And third, no significant connection between racial identity and social standing. That is, in the level of esteem and regard with which one is viewed by one's fellow citizens should have no connection to racial identity either. And uh, we'll talk about each of those, but I think we've not yet encountered a world in which negative stereotypes about African Americans have disappeared from the landscape. Now, to be fair, to be completely fair, popular culture also yields some signs that the post-racial narrative is overstated. Having tried to convince you that the narrative is out there, that it has various form and flavors, and that it is now probably the predominant or hegemonic way of thinking about race in America, I want to start taking some deeper cuts now at problematizing uh, the notion even further. So, for example, consider the Glazer and uh, Vigdor um, report on the end of the segregated century again. Now, the report itself does not come close to sustaining its provocative title. Um, indeed, the report is a little deceptive since it mainly reports on black versus other measures of the level of segregation. So just think of black versus other. And yes, well, blacks do now have much more residential contact with Asians and especially Latinos. Black-white segregation, however, has undergone far less change and remains high, especially in the Midwest and Northeast. The Pew report on the headlines about uh, racial intermarriage uh, also can be misleading. For their 2010 assessment, these are 2010 data, they find that only 8% of all marriages are mixed race marriages. Only 8%. That gives 92% that are racially homogeneous. <laughs> That's a big number, 92%. Um, and uh, if you just paid attention to the newest marriages, which may be the more discerning figure, 15% of the newest or most recent marriages are mixed race marriages. And that number, of course, is way up from the past. Again, the flip side of that is 85% remain racially homogeneous. And as to the New York Times and multiracial identification, still less than 3%, less than 3% of Americans nationwide marked more than one box in 2010. The imagination has leapt well ahead of the reality. But the headlines continue to encourage us to think in terms of the end of blackness and the end of whiteness and to assume, in fact, that post-racialism is not. <laughs> right? That that's the thrust of, of where we are. I want to take steps now to problematize this even further, uh, if I may. And I want to do that in three big clumps. Um, I want to talk about a series of celebrity gaffes that should make us think twice about the post-racial narrative. I want to give evidence of everyday acts of bias or microaggressions that continue to give evidence of the persistence of race and the failure to achieve post-racialism. And then perhaps even more important to signal some ways in which there remain significant forms of institutional uh, bias uh, on the basis of race. Uh, but let's start with this depressing uh, memory. <laughs> so I watched the basketball game last night between a little bit of Rutgers and Tennessee, the women's uh, final. Yeah, Tennessee won last night, seven championship for Pat Summit. I man, they beat Rutgers by 13 points. On some rough girls from Rutgers, man, they got tattoos and Hardcore hoes. That's, that's a nappy headed hose there. I'll take that down. Man, that's some goof. And uh, <clears throat> the girls from Tennessee, they all look cute, you know, so. Like, kind of like a, I don't know, Spike Lee thing. Yeah. yeah. The versus the Wannabes. Yeah, you know, that movie that he had. Yeah, it was a tough, uh, do the right thing. I don't yeah, know yeah. if I'd have wanted to beat Rutgers or not, but they did, right? Yeah, yeah they it's did. a tough watch. More looking Walker is it? They look exactly like the Toronto Raptors. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess, you know. I'm a lead jumper. Well, the Grizzlies would be mad. Front page 
region. Now, uh, that little segment of commentary did end up costing uh, uh, Don Imus significantly. But you've got to remember this was a nationally televised program, a nationally broadcast radio show that had been on for years. There was nothing new about the content of what they did that day. Something about insulting those young women in that moment finally, finally got him in trouble. But I want to give you a flavor of what had been going on with him before. Gwen Eiffel, who now anchors um, the news on PBS, right? He had for years uh, insulted her. Uh, she, when she was New York Times, uh, Washington, D.C. bureau chief, he commented that, isn't the Times wonderful? It lets the cleaning lady cover the White House. This is 1998. Um, he routinely, he and his uh, uh, cohorts there, routinely told ape jokes about black athletes, indeed literally referring to Patrick Ewing as a knuckle-dragging moron. And in 2000, they referred to Gloria Estefan, a number member of his team, as a little chihuahua-looking hoe. And so I just want to underscore for you that he had millions upon millions of people in a daily audience and this went on for years. And almost by accident in 2007, there was a collection of forces that forced him off the air. I want to make the point that it's a huge part of our culture that he lasted so long before paying uh, any price for it. Of course, uh, Don Imus is not the only one to engage in these sort of celebrity gaffes. Distinguished intellectual who brought us the double helix, uh, James Watson, and the ability to map DNA, goes on to speculate about inherent differences in intelligence and ability um, tied to race, costing him uh, uh, dearly in terms of where he's recognized and invited to speak. And I could go on and on in this vein with radio disc jockey Laura and commentator Laura Schlesinger and her N-word rant, comedian Michael Richards and his N-word rant, or more recently NFL player Richie Incognito and his N-word rant. It's not that uncommon uh, 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 an occurrence. There are also other types of microaggressions. Uh, as you may recall the case in Philadelphia in 2009 when a uh, black community group had arranged, contracted with a private swimming club to bring a group of kids in to go swimming. Uh, when they entered uh, the, the private, presumably virtually or literally all white swimming club, one of those there commented, what are all these black kids doing here? They might do something to my child. As the spokesman said later, once they forced the black kids out of the pool and forced them to leave the facility to try to explain what they did, well, there was a concern that a lot of kids would change the complexion. Um, this club did end up uh, getting uh, fined and, spa and facing uh, severe sanctions. Thank goodness someone in the media decided to cover it and bring it to the world's attention. More recently, near the institution where I work and in Boston, a group of Harvard alumni tried to enter a club uh, in downtown Boston and were refused uh, admission. Uh, the club uh, initially denied they had done this. They were dealing with the wrong group of well-paid, highly intelligent Negroes who fairly quickly established that, yeah, they had done this and done it on a pretty racial basis. And uh, they did have to apologize and pay a fine. Um, and then, of course, there is the event, the, the, the glass of beer heard round the world, the arrest of my dear friend and colleague, uh, Henry Louis Gates uh, Jr., um, on his own uh, porch. I go here in part because it symbolizes the state's relation to African Americans, that an internationally famous African American wealthy male can be arrested on his own porch for disorderly conduct. Um, Reaching a whole new low. Uh, it makes you think. Your home is safe. But is it safe from black intellectuals? Hello. This is Gates Home Security. Are you alright? Someone tried to break in. Harvard Professor Henry Louis Gates? I'm not sure. He had his hands it could have been Cornell West. <laughs> Henry Louis Gates can strike at any time. Make sure your family is safe. Gates Home Security also protects against Tabas Smiley, my Angela. Jackie Robinson, Soldier Drew, Angela Smiley, Tabas Smiley, Angela Smiley, Tabas 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 Smiley, Tabas
affirmative action. <laughs> you got to love that video. Uh, the Bill Maher show put that together not 24 hours after the public release of the information about uh, Gates' arrest, and it's just, it's just priceless lampooning of uh, what, what happened here. There are, of course, much more serious instantiations of this problem of institutional bias, especially involving the practices of police. I think in particular, not far from here, the stop and frisk policy uh, in New York where thousands upon thousands of black and Latino youth uh, have uh, been stopped, frisked, and often uh, arrested or put into the police databanks, and essentially bear the heavy burden of state intrusion into their daily lives in a way that other citizens do not have to encounter. Uh, and in a society, um, and I think it's unfortunate that in our society we have made it tolerable uh, to base a social policy and policing practice on the routine suspicion and close state regulation of black and Latino youth under the guise of doing reasonable police work. Um, I quite frankly think it's despicable uh, and needs to stop. We can move out of this arena and think in terms of other arenas like the home loan uh, markets. Tonight, one of the worst offenders in the mortgage crisis, Countrywide Financial, has agreed to pay $335 million, a record, for steering African Americans and Hispanics into risky, expensive mortgages. Cheryl Ackeson reports this case of predatory lending ripped off an astounding number of victims. The Justice Department says Countrywide cheated 200,000 African American and Hispanic customers, charging them higher fees and interest rates than their white counterparts in 41 states and the District of Columbia. Thomas Perez heads up the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division. They were thrilled to have gotten a loan and realized the American dream. They had no idea they could have and should have gotten a better deal. At the height of the boom, Countrywide was the largest mortgage lender in the country and is blamed for making some of the worst loans. A third of them ended in foreclosure or default. Justice Department officials allege Countrywide steered minority borrowers into risky subprime loans, usually with costlier terms, such as exploding adjustable interest rates that rose dramatically after just two or three years. In 2007, an African-American family in Los Angeles getting a $200,000 loan from Countrywide paid $1,200 more in fees than similarly qualified white borrowers. The investigation began after the Federal Reserve and the Treasury Department alerted the Justice Department to potential discrimination by Countrywide. The case announced today isn't a prosecution, it's a settlement, so no one goes to jail. If it gets the court's approval, victims can apply for a piece of a $335 million compensation, roughly $1,675 a piece. Countrywide's now owned by Bank of America, but Cheryl, I wonder, why didn't the government bring criminal charges in this case? We asked about that, and the Justice Department told us that their goal in this investigation was not to prosecute executives, but to identify discriminatory practices and recover money for a wide class of the victims. Cheryl, thanks very much. And again, the, the major point here for this afternoon's talk is that a key sector of our economy, there was massive routine race-based discrimination uh, that was a factor in an epic economic collapse. And this predatory lending practice was deeply facilitated by the existence of certain other social conditions. Racial segregation tied to class inequality. There were certain neighborhoods where you could easily get away with this set of predatory practices, and they were black and brown uh, neighborhoods. Now, of course, the event that kind of epitomized institutional failure and the place where race and class meet uh, was Hurricane uh, Katrina, right? Uh, and we all recall powerfully those images from the summer of 2005, late summer of 2005, as uh, hundreds and thousands of people were left, in effect, um, stranded uh, by their own government in what is supposed to be uh, the most powerful and most affluent nation uh, in the world. And I'll let Wolf Blitzer make the point here. You, you, you simply get chills every time you see these poor individuals, as Jack uh, Caffrey just pointed out, uh, so tragically, so many of these people, almost all of them that we see are so poor 
and they are so black, and this is going to raise lots of questions for people who are watching this story unfold. So poor and so black. Uh, he'd said that, uh, and he was just recounting what he and the world was seeing. Now, I don't want to leave the impression that this post-racial argument rests entirely on culling observations from trade books uh, and the popular press. There are any number of intellectuals of more serious scholarly moment wrestling with and advancing much the same argument, and I want to give you some sampling of those as well, and uh, visit the more scholarly version of serious intellectual formulations of the post-racial argument. Consider, for example, the writings of uh, African-American uh, distinguished English scholar Ken Warren of the University of Chicago and his argument about the end of African-American uh, literature. He writes, quote, historically speaking, the collective enterprise we call African-American or black literature is of recent vintage. In fact, it is just a little more than a century old. Further, it has already come to an end, and the latter is a fact we should neither regret nor lament. He declares this just two years ago in the pages of the Chronicle of Higher Education and in a book that uh, followed quickly on the heels of uh, this declaration. Or consider the field of history uh, and distinguished uh, UC Berkeley historian David Hollinger, who in an essay in the publication Daedalus, uh, and this is really the first paragraph of this very petulant defensive and almost angry essay, he writes, quote, why are so many people afraid of the concept of post-racial and post-ethnic? Both are often brushed aside amid a competition over who can declare the most resoundingly that racism is still a vital problem in the United States and that the physical marks of dissent remain highly determinative of an individual's um, destiny. He goes on to write, uh, that uh, the term post-ethnic, as he once termed it, appealed to me then and still does because it implies a strong holdover from the past but a refinement of that legacy in relation to new opportunities and constraints. So too with post-racial, all right? Uh, although he dwells not at all on what the past was like in advancing this argument, the basis for his enthusiasm and excitement about the label post-racial is as follows. Um, he says, I focus on two highly diversifying demographic trends that continue to inspire post-ethnic, post-racial writers and that get short shrift in the competition to show just how bad racism still is. One is the extent and character of cross-group marriage, cohabitation, and reproduction. I've talked a bit about that already. The second is the extent and character of recent immigration, especially of darker-skinned uh, peoples all of which foreordained to him uh, the rightness of the rising post-racial uh, narrative. Sociology is not immune to those advancing uh, this argument or versions of it. Consider demographer Charles Hirschman implying that we're about to witness the collapse of race altogether or that really that we should. He says in a major paper, the thesis of this essay is that the common view uh, officially sanctioned in some countries, notably in the US, of race as a fundamental and relatively stable ascriptive attribute of human populations is flawed. To put the matter simply, there is no conceptual basis for race except racism. He doesn't want us to talk about it at all because for him it's an intrinsically racist notion and we're at a point where we can stop doing that unless we want to be part of a racist project. Uh, in his formulation. Um, he goes on to say, uh, racism or racial ideology assumes that aspects of physical appearance, phenotype, are outward manifestations of heritable traits such as abilities, propensities for certain behaviors and other socio-cultural characteristics. This assumption, though widely accepted only a couple of generations ago, has been put to rest by recent genetic research. That is, the very notion of race to his mind has been debunked. Let's get past it. We don't have to engage it uh, anymore. We could also add other sociologists, because I think in many ways Richard Alba kind of fits this perspective as well. Uh, now, to push it to the to point of ultimate academic credibility, of course, it has to be endorsed by an economist somewhere along the way. 
And uh, so I want to take recourse to a Nobel Prize winning economist, very thoughtful man actually, uh, James Heckman, who is not so much fundamentally uh, denouncing the concept of race, but he is very expressly arguing that racial discrimination is no longer a first order problem. It's a second order issue. Overt discrimination, he writes, is no longer a first order problem in American society. Discrimination exists and, of course, should be eliminated. The evidence suggests, however, that discrimination in how skills are rewarded does not account for much of the achievement gap in contemporary America. All right? So there's noise. There's some noise in the system still out there. But racial discrimination, headline issue in the 40s and 50s, not anymore today, according to Professor Heckman. Uh, now, of course, there are alternative views out there. I don't think they're the dominant views, but they exist, and it's necessary to acknowledge those, of course. There's a whole camp of folks who've argued about the intractability of racism in the American experience and view it indeed as America's tragic flaw. I think of figures like legal scholar Derek Bell and his influential book, Faces at the Bottom of the Well, philosopher Charles Mills and his book, The Racial Contract, arguing that the Enlightenment theory of the social contract was never envisioned as embracing non-Europeans. Never, from day one to present. Um, and of course, sociologist, former American Sociological Association President Joe Fagan, in his book, uh, Racist America, argue, arguing that it was basically established as a white supremacist system. There are a whole array of other scholars not quite in that camp who nonetheless continue to write about the changing significance of race and racism. Probably most significant here, uh, sociologist demographer Douglas Massey. His argument, I think, has evolved a lot over recent years, William Julius Wilson, uh, and of course, uh, former ASA president Barbara Reskin, who's provided some real new leverage on how to think about the phenomena of um, uh, discrimination. I want to kind of start to bring this to a close by noting that um, the significance of race actually grows in some domains of social life. Rather than trying to parse all the evidence on whether or not direct racial discrimination uh, is an issue, I want to do something a lot more straightforward, to just go and looking at instances where racial gaps are in fact widening in the current era. Not near equality, not narrowing, but vastly widening. Uh, so that facially, it means we have to engage this race issue just on the surface of it, that the demographic reality is an unavoidable thing in a way, and quite frankly, the real subtext here is that and the analytical substance and causal significance of racialized social processes is something you can't escape if you think about these three domains. Um, I'll consider first uh, the economy. And here I'm gonna simply talk about what many of you have probably discussed, and that's gaps uh, in wealth. And what I have here are figures from a recent Pew Foundation and Pew Research Center study on the consequences of the Great Recession, uh, the recent economic downturn, on the wealth holding of black, white, and Latino Americans. And essentially they asked the question, what fraction of each group's wealth was wiped out by the economic downturn? And you see the numbers. About one-fifth of white wealth was destroyed by the economic uh, decline. Two-thirds of Hispanic wealth was destroyed, and over half of African American wealth was destroyed. Now, why the disparities? The main reason for it is that black and Latino households, Latino households even more than black, uh, black, uh, white, black households, were dependent on home ownership as their sole source of wealth. So when your home is suddenly valueless, or when the value of the home is greatly exceeded by how much you owe on it, <laughs> uh, that is, the house is debt, not an asset, um, this is what happens, all right? Uh, your wealth vanishes. Um, and uh, the impact has really been quite uh, gargantuan. They try to put it in more concrete dollar terms, and here are the figures showing in 2009 and 2005, uh, the uh, net worth of households by race with uh, Hispa whites, Hispanics, and blacks 
And those are some gargantuan, gargantuan differences. The wealth gap, roughly the mid 80s, was somewhere between, depending on the estimates, six to one to 10 to one disparity. Huge. You wanna know what it is now? Look at these now. It's 20 to one. The wealth gap is now 20 to one. And there's just not a chance that's closing anytime soon. All right. Uh, the increasing significance of race. I'm gonna skip that figure from Tom Shapiro. Let's think about what's happening in our political system, the polity, and I'm not even gonna focus on voting rights and the ways in which voting hindrance efforts in various states and Supreme Court ruling and validating sections of the Voting Rights Act are at work. I'm not even gonna talk about affirmative action and the ways in which we have a Supreme Court that is looking for the case that will allow it to end it completely. <laughs> Actively looking for the case that will let them do that. Um, let's pretend that that's not out there. What I'm gonna talk about, of course, is our criminal justice system and what I call seven distressing facts. And I like to do these seven distressing facts, not because I enjoy depressing people, um, but because these are a collection of facts put together by a Dust Bowl statistician empiric uh, empiricist criminologist named Alfred Blumstein at the Carnegie Mellon School. And I do that because this is no zealot, this is no ideologue, this is no policy advocate, this is a guy who counts numbers all day long <laughs> and only believes in numbers, all right? and non-sociologists. So those of you who worry about the ideology within this discipline got nothing to do with it. So what does Professor Bloomstein tell us? That the black incarceration rate in 1999 was nearly triple what it had been in 1980. That the black incarceration rate in 1980 times, the ratio had gone to eight to one, roughly, uh, black to non-Hispanic white that fully 2% of the black population was incarcerated in 1999 in state or federal prison, that almost one in 10 black males in their 20s were in state or federal prison, that roughly a third of black males in their 20s were under some form of criminal justice supervision on probation, parole, or in prison, that in some jurisdictions, Washington DC, Baltimore, more than 50% of black males in their 20s were under criminal justice supervision, and that if you were to do the sort of actuarial forecast that uh, insurance companies do on a routine basis and ask the question, what are the chances that a black male born in the 90s would spend some time in jail or prison, you would find that it's roughly one in three, uh, whereas it's not even one in 10 for non-Hispanic uh, white males the grossly increasing significance of race with respect uh, to who is in our jails and prisons. Now this finally became the subject of national attention in the larger sense, in that in 2008, Pew issued this report called One in 100. You may remember the headlines because all the major newspapers put it on the front page, all the nightly news programs covered it as well. The US had reached a deeply embarrassing moment for the most powerful and affluent nation in the world is also the world's number one incarcerator of its own citizens. Worse than Russia, worse than South Africa at the height of the apartheid regime, worse than communist China, worse than Syria and Iraq, okay? Worse than Zimbabwe and Rwanda, all right? We win at incarcerating people. We incarcerate more than 700 adults per 100,000 uh, in this country. Nobody else is even close. So that one in 100 number is a shocking thing. And I thought, all right, cool headline, they made it stick. But you know what? If they had wanted to title this report about black men, you know what the number would have been based on their own data and tables? One in 15, one in 15. And what if they had decided to base it on young black men, black men under the age of 25? One in eight, one in eight is what that number would have been. So as I say, I like to call it the increasing significance of race. And again, I've ignored affirmative action and voting rights rolled back. Um, the last thing I wanna talk about is our culture. And I'm not gonna go to any single example, but I wanna lead into what I'm about to do by saying, this is all about the deep stickiness 
of the culture of racialized thinking and of racism in America. The deep, deep, deep stickiness of it. And why it doesn't go away kind of on its own or because we think we've made some progress or introduced one or another reform. And it tries to do it in a humorous way. Uh, and it is deeply humorous. But I think it makes the point about the stickiness of race in the American mind. Of course, we've already had announcements from big names like Hillary Clinton, John Edwards. This happened before Obama declared his candidacy in 07. Who, if I'm not mistaken, withdrew from the race the same day. <laughs> of course, the announcement everyone's waiting for is Barack Obama's. Now, Senator Obama is not the first African American to run as president, but he's the first African American to have a prayer, which is ironic since two of the others were reverence. <laughs> Obama will announce his candidacy this weekend at the Old State Capitol in Springfield, Illinois, where Abraham Lincoln made his stirring House Divided speech. How historic. At a building made famous by the man who freed the slaves, now begins the presidential campaign of a man who is the descendant of slaves. Of course, the buzz killers out there want to drain the significance of this event just because Obama isn't the descendant of slaves. His father immigrated from Kenya in 1959, and his mom is the Swiss Miss Girl. <laughs> some, some are even claiming that the senator has not lived the, quote, black experience, and it may affect his support in the African-American community. Here to explain is columnist for Salon.com and author of the book, The End of Blackness, Deborah Dickerson. Ms. Dickerson, thank you for joining us. Your book is The, uh, the End of Blackness, and I want to come out right here and say uh, I'm against the end of blackness. Uh, I believe that everyone has a right to be black. It's a choice, and I support that. Now, um, <laughs> Context, black means the son of West African, the, the uh, descendant of West African slaves brought here to labor in the United States. It's not a put down, it's not to say that he hasn't suffered, it's not to say that he doesn't have a glorious lineage of his own, it's just to say that he and I, who are descended from West African slaves brought to America, yeah. we are not the same. Okay, so if he's not black, why doesn't he just run as a white guy? Because we know black people will vote for white people, and white people will vote for white people, but we're not sure white people will vote for black people. So it seems like by self-identifying as a black man, because he says that he's a black guy, he says, nobody thought a black guy born in Hawaii with a father from Kenya and a mother from Kansas could actually win a race. So why didn't he say, you know, I'm a white guy? That, I mean, then it's a lock. Right. Well, he's not white either. He is an African African-American, or he is an American. Should we American. give a new name for what he is? Well, yeah, we need a new name. He's not a new black. <laughs> <laughs> you know, late to the scene. Yeah. I'm thinking now because black is circumstances allow. Right. <laughs> I 
Yeah, that's just one of the most astonishing six minutes of television that's ever occurred. And <laughs> but it really makes the point about the stickiness of race uh, in America, and in some ways the brilliance of Barack Obama, because he knew all along he couldn't run as not black, <laughs> whereas many people, including serious intellectuals, did not. Uh, I want to stop here, because this has gone on for um, a long bit and just kind of wrap this up and say, yes, uh, Americans want to be done with race and race talk. The boundaries are more complicated, context-dependent, and fluid, yes. The population is much more diverse and globally interconnected, trends that are quite likely to continue. The features and dynamics of the economic, the legal, political, and the cultural landscape no longer correspond to a simple black-white binary, as once dictated by the Jim Crow social order. However, in the light of persistent inequality across most significant domains of social life, high rates of ongoing discrimination, and of the sociological reality of a cumulative, multi-domain, sedimentary and reinforcing quality of racial inequality, we cannot simply conclude that we as a nation have done enough. It is analytically wrong to do so and politically corrosive. It is neither odd, disconnected, nor inappropriate to expect and indeed demand more. America moves forward when people demand fulfillment of the big ideals and aspirations on which the nation was founded. Or to state the matter a little more concretely, I take seriously an old adage regarding race in America. It holds that in civil rights there is no standing still. One is either moving forward or falling back. In particular, in the absence of a serious, progressive, organized project, continuing to make the case for positive racial change, the nature of our social system is likely to allow the reforging, if not worsening, of old racial divisions. We need to see the post-racial narrative for what it is, an easy out, an ideological palliative. It treats the worry, anxiety, and sense of continued injustice that accompanies persistent racial inequality with the reassuring haze of blurred visions and misperception and distorted understanding, while the deep structure of invidious distinction, privilege for some and disprivilege for others, continues. Thank you very much. So, I should take questions. <laughs> Comments. <laughs> yes, way in the back. One, one behind you, then I'll come down to you. <laughs> so, uh, in the, the white-black divide, um, how do you see, I mean, you mentioned this in terms of segregation, um, the 
Latino question that seems to be so dominant now. Uh -huh. um, in terms of the future of the Republican Party, in terms of immigration, um, and the statistics of the Latino community, too, which are quite yeah. close to the yeah. African-American community, yeah. what, where do you see the growing Latino population? What effect it will have on race, race yeah. racialized racism and just racism in general? Uh, there, there are a couple dimensions here. One uh, is, great question, is uh, to think about um, the current socioeconomic context for Latinos. The Latino population is enormously internally heterogeneous, uh, coming from many different parts of the world, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Colombia, El Salvador, Brazil, what, what have you. Uh, but the largest single fraction is from Mexico, right? Nearly 60% uh, are of Mexican uh, origin. And a huge element of that 60% are here on an undocumented basis. I guess estimates now, you know, 10 to 12 million kind of undocumented individuals. Doug Massey has argued, and I find the evidence persuasive, that we are at the moment have translated those undocumented individuals into a new and, in fact, more exploitable underclass. That that's, in effect, how they're being treated. And I think uh, intellectually a lot of what needs to happen is a close inspection of a series of policy changes in really the 1980s, in the Reagan era, that began both rolling back the welfare state, ignoring the labor market dynamics, and raising the stakes of the war on crime, war on drugs, and its impact on black America, and at the same time pushing ahead with massive free trade agreements at the same time that we're clamping down on the border and making it more difficult for people to move back and forth across the border, which really created this huge undocumented population. So both problems, the origins of which historically come out of that era. So that there are lots of ways in which there are issues of deep commonality in the black and Latino um, communities. The current moment, to connect back to another piece of your question, is about what do the major political parties do here? And even more urgently, will the Republicans find a way out of their deeply suicidal commitment to hostility to immigrants? Uh, and quite frankly, my hope is it takes four or five more years for them to get that figured out, that, that they really are shooting themselves right between the eyes. Uh, and for the time being, while they're trying to keep the Tea Party in the tent, I think they're stuck, because one of its core concerns is just the most ungenerous view of immigrants and immigration imaginable. And I don't know if any of you have read or looked at the terms of the so-called Senate uh, immigration bill. It's one of the most draconian things imaginable. It says if you came in here illegally, but you can prove you've been here continuously and have never left, we'll give you provisional membership in the polity for 10 years. During that time, you qualify for no government benefits of any kind for 10 years. At the end of that 10-year period, we'll let you apply for a green card. <laughs> and then a year or two after that, after you've paid an initial fine and a later fine, maybe let you apply for citizenship. That is, we're going to insist that you be a non-member of the polity for at least 12 more years entitled to nothing. If you get even a misdemeanor, you're out. Uh, this is the progressive reform legislation that came out of the Senate, which the House Republicans won't even discuss. <laughs> yeah, so I don't see them changing this soon, uh, given that orientation uh, to this issue. Now, it changes the racial landscape in lots of other ways, and given the fluidity and mixture, but none of us knows where that goes, but it is one arena in which blacks, by and large, are advantaged because blacks tend to be citizens. So they don't have those deportation concerns. They don't have those risks if they exercise political voice, uh, whereas uh, Latinos do. But on things like health care, things like education, things like whether the state intervenes on behalf of the weak and the poor, and just enormous commonality, I guess. That's kind of my short answer. To your, that the, so that the racialization of Latinos is a big process now, the commonality of interest is huge, and I don't see Republicans as finding an easy path out of their intransigence on immigration at the present moment. Then I'll get you, since I promised you you were next. <laughs> I want to ask two things. One yeah. was, uh, I'd like to hear your analysis of the way that right-wing political culture 
much has dealt with the, the person of the president. Oh, yeah. And the, the, this extraordinary reaction to him, which um, seems pretty inexplicable given that he's basically a fairly inoffensive individual. Yeah. So they, they, there seems to me to be, a, 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 you know, this underlying racial ideology, and how does that work? The other thing I wanted to ask is yeah. a more sociological question in a way, which is uh, your graph of the uh, household income. How would it look if you dis disaggregated the, your racial groups there by by social class? Because it seems to me that one thing that's missing there is that the, the gap looks so big because actually. The white upper class segment is so huge. I mean, there's not well, gaps between the other class segments, but, other. But, but a huge proportion of that gap is in the white upper class. And I think what that does bring me to is surely, in a way, one's got to talk about <coughs> racial inequality articulated with class yeah. inequality yeah. in yeah. terms of trying to address this. All right, so race and class inequality on the wealthy. Let me do that first, and then don't let me forget oh, and Obama and the right wing. Um, let me say on the, the inequality issue, uh, there's a neat figure, but it's not in this PowerPoint, and I'd have to search around to find it, that, that makes the point that uh, it really is only the 1% who did well over the 90s, and, and by astronomical margins, uh, staggering. Uh, and if you did a figure kind of like the scale I had there, you'd have high-income blacks, high-income whites, uh, at the bottom, low-income whites, low-income blacks in terms of wealth holdings. And then you'd see a line that went like this for the highest 1% of whites. And I mean, really, the rest of the chart is down here. So that the wealth inequality generated in the last decade and a half is phenomenal. So that the U.S. on charts of inequality now increasingly looks like Brazil, which used to be the poster child for a politically dangerous level of inequality. And that's where we are. Uh, and so a lot of that has nothing to do with race, but with the tax code and the enormous privileging of the super wealthy. Um, there's a lot of stuff happening in the middle range that is much more tied to race. And I like the way you put it at the end, because my critique of the left has often been, you know, they say uh, a racial discourse is uh, a polarizing one when it's really the class issue that unites us. And I go, you know, I can get behind a class discourse as long as every time you launch it, you acknowledge that in the US we created a bottom class tier that's people of color. And as long as that's an express part of the argument, that we created a class system where the bottom is people of color, and that we cannot have a class discussion totally decoupled from race, I'm kind of there. Because <laughs> you're, you're, you're right on that. On Obama. As I had a, a great discussion with a group of students at lunch today. My take on Obama is that, uh, especially for the right wing, these are folks who never thought of having an African-American president, right? And they can get over 2008 because Bush was such an abysmal failure by the end that almost any Democrat was going to win. And they all kind of knew that, sadly, but they knew it was going to happen. Uh, and so they can view Obama's first term as a mistake as an anomaly, as something that comes out of two failed wars, Katrina, and a collapsed economy, which is a whole lot to have go wrong. <laughs> uh, so we get this guy, but we're going to make him. And remember, Mitch McConnell says this. He's going to be a one-term president. Guy says this out loud. Um, and then they lose again in 2012. After standing there thinking they were going to win, folks who were in the Boston area as I was and Mitt Romney was going to celebrate downtown and all his zillionaire friends are there, when the projections started coming in early, the hotel staff people are funny. All these guys called up the airport, fueled up their jets and left. Uh, <laughs> they thought they were going to party that night and boy were they wrong. Uh, America's a different country. But this is the fight. These are guys trying to prevent the change in this country that is the Obama coalition. And they're really angry. Uh, and it's not all about race. If I had to put a number on it, I'd say 60% of it is about race. But the level of open contempt and derision that Obama has faced is just inconceivable. Uh, and I didn't bring it here, but you, you may remember the car. When Obama first came in, you may recall there was a, a newsworthy story about a, a woman 
who had been attacked by her friend's chimpanzee, and the chimpanzee more or less tore her face off, and police had to shoot the chimp. And there was a political cartoon that shows two cops having shot this chimp, and the, the bubble uh, dialogue above it says, I guess they'll have to find someone else to draft the new stimulus bill. Uh, as, you know, and you know, there, in the US, especially tomorrow being the 50th anniversary of Kennedy's, it has never been humorous to joke about shooting a president of the United States, yet this stuff happens with regularity around Obama. And it's just not possible to read that outside of a racial field, I think. Um, yes. It's, it's I, only a very small class of, you know, of, of the corporate wealthy that are financing the universities I mean, in terms of the big bucks. The big Why donors? Is this more of a discussion at the universities? Oh. Um, well, because there's, you know, an unacknowledged arms race to get your share of that money <laughs> from people that goes on, especially among all the elite institutions. The main discourse now, of course, and I, I would actually frame it in a different way, I think we see a movement in corporate America to try to discipline universities and institutions of higher learning. And part of that push to discipline them is going to be the claim that the middle class can no longer afford to attend these institutions. But the objective really is to bring corporate control corporate objectives and corporate standards of evaluation to universities. That's the real pressure uh, that's afoot out there because it's one of the few sectors that is not yet fully under corporate control. Um, and the push to do that is huge. And Harvard, among all the institutions, because it's so wealthy, because it's so prestigious, because it's so prominent, works very hard to always not be the most expensive, to always have the most generous financial aid uh, arrangements, even to the point of actually creating internal pressures that a purely self-interested faculty member should resist. Because <laughs> uh, if you wanted more money in some ways, Harvard's the wrong place to be because Harvard made this commitment, for example, to middle class families. You know, if you're a household earning less than $250,000 a year and your child gets admitted on this need blind basis, you go free. Uh, which instantly doubled the structural deficit in the college. And when the recession hit, boom, uh, Harvard thought it's a big public commitment, we can't back out of it. And it's still there, <laughs> uh, despite the whammy of the uh, economic downturn. Harvard's president is paid half of what lots of other very uh, pre prominent presidents of much lesser institutions uh, earn. So Harvard works in lots of ways to never be the leading edge of what costs uh, in the system, even at the time it's striving to try to be number one in all the other things you talk about, raising money, maintaining its endowment, uh, uh, and the like. But I say, if you ask me, the pressure I worry about is the corporate control pressure uh, and to really take control of setting tuition costs and all that, that I, I think there's an enormous consensus emerging among economic elites to try to do that. And you watch what the effect of that will be in terms of corporate control within institutions of higher learning. Yes. Uh, it's becoming more important than race. No, uh, I don't think so. And um, and but this is part of what I mean by the the fluidity and complexity in the system is without question much greater 
now. And even the degree of movement in some sense is greater. If you were to ask what, do, what was the accomplishment in some ways of the civil rights era, or one of the great enduring accomplishments, it was to force American society to open the door at least a bit to the most talented members of almost all minority groups. That you could no longer close out even the most talented from your top institutions of learning, uh, the core corporate sector, or politics. But if you let in that 2%, 3%, 5 maybe even 10%, vigorous resistance to doing any more than that, all right? Uh, and I would say that might operate close to across the board. Uh, and that, in a way, the emphasis on ethnicity, again, for me, becomes kind of a, uh, a retreat from progress on the positive racial project. And the way I try to put this in my classes is to think about the other arenas uh, where you might say, God, other places have much greater heterogeneity complexity in their racial thinking than the US. Why can't we get there? For example, why can't we be more like Brazil? Where everyday discourse might recognize 90, 95 different gradations of skin color and tonation, right? Well, if you look carefully at Brazil, it's an astonishingly unequal society and an inequality that aligns, I don't want to say perfectly, but pretty profoundly with some pretty simple racial distinctions. And so all the talk of hybridity mixed is masking an underlying dynamic that is still deeply racialized. So that uh, I don't want to go there <laughs> in that kind of way, that if you don't really have an explicit positive racial project, you end up letting the, those dynamics operate uh, in ways that maintain those inequalities. So you get Brazil and its, its notion of being a racial democracy, right? A place that achieved recognition of African roots and heritage, lots of mixture at the boundaries, <laughs> no big mixes, and where almost all the elite are white. Uh, and you gotta go, I, look, I've seen that story. To think about another case, Cuba. Let's flip it, let's take it out of a capitalist world and look at a communist nation that actually declared, unlike capitalism, we're gonna actually eliminate racism under the socialist state. Um, and you get a communist regime that quite frankly, almost did it in material terms. Circa 1980, if you went to Cuba, differences in educational attainment, differences in the wages people were paid, their earnings, and to a substantial but not totally the actual jobs they held by racial categories had been almost eliminated. Cuba had about on paper done it. They'd gotten rid of material racial inequality. What they had not done was have an overt dialogue about race, and what they had not done uh, was undo the underlying cultural bias. So then something happens. The Soviet empire collapses the enormous financial intervention the Soviets poured into Cuba vanishes overnight. Five, ten billion dollars a year just goes. And for a small island nation, they were oftentimes bordering on near starvation once that money was gone. They have to open the door to more remittances from the US. Now what does that mean? Remittances from the US. The old white elite displaced by the revolution starts sending money to their family members the racial gap starts to open again. We need more tourism, but the people who had always been in the elite occupations are the lighter skinned, whiter Cubans. The gap starts to open wider. We have to have a currency we can tra trade on the global market and get more of this money to stay here. They introduce an economy for people working in the, tr in the uh, tourist sector of the, again, mostly the white Cubans. All those racial inequalities come running back to the scene. <laughs> in lots of forms, under a totally different economic regime. Uh, and they reassert, and you get people and they say, why did this happen? Why, did, for example, did the tourist industry do this? And you know what their overt reasoning was? Well, in order for tourists to come here, they have to deal with people who have una buena presencia. You know, you have to have a, a pleasant appearance. Uh, <laughs> and this is what happens when you haven't dealt with race kind of head on and other dynamics and issues come along and lingering resource inequalities are present. So I don't, 
I don't think any of that changes it. Now, the other argument, and maybe this is the Bonilla Silva version, is that this is some kind of cynical manipulation. Uh, I don't think it's that coordinated, but I think it is part of a, a project in which a certain segment of very talented elites are going to be allowed a higher fraction of, that that the system really has often done. And that's its way of resolving these pressures from very talented people who are locked in. Because otherwise you radicalize people if, if really talented people have no prospects for mobility. Um, I mean, imagine a world in which Malcolm X had been able to run for president. <laughs> right? Uh, radicalism is at a different whole level. Um, uh, in that, I don't know if that's a full answer to your question, but <laughs> I'm starting down that road. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, was, was you could uh, clarify that the, um, some distinctions between, say, the post-racialist uh, or post-racist racial versions uh, that you talked about, uh -huh. the blurring of the boundaries and yeah. that truly beyond race concept, in uh, your own criterion about no significant connection between racial yeah. identification and uh, material political or social uh, it seems that in, in at least the popular versions, um, individuals are talking about racial equality achieved through racial integration or assimilation. So the Hirschman quote, uh, the idea of blurring boundaries truly beyond race. Well, with your, your criteria, it sounds less like post-racial and more post-racist, where you're talking about equalities of a sort of material and political standard. Uh, and so I, I guess I was wondering if, uh, you, you know, there's one view of equality where, you know, we can keep all sorts of racial distinctions yeah. as long as yep. we're not playing important economic and political roles. Yeah. Where the post-racial versions you were talking about were really saying, well, we can achieve, you know, equality, I think, but you have to integrate. I think I'm con deliberately conflating two things. And the way to think about it is a really brilliant book by a friend and former colleague, Eddie Teus, uh, Race in Another America on Brazil where he draws a distinction between horizontal integration and vertical integration. And so most of the things, not all, but most of the things I talked about were on the vertical integration side. Hierarchy uh, and making sure that access to uh, kind of key material rewards economically or power resources, political treatment by the state are not differential. But I also expressly include the cultural domain of respect and regard from others. Uh, and I do that in part to get that social dimension. Because part of his characterization of Brazil, and Brazilians really have this, we interact with everybody. We recognize an African partial African heritage to everything that happens here. Uh, people marry at these boundary points across kind of the color uh, spectrum. There's no sense of not interacting uh, in, a, in a positive way across the color hierarchy, even if jobs, politics, and to a degree where you live are still heavily tied to race. And that that's part of why Cubans continue to embrace the, uh, the sense that race doesn't matter here as the official ideology and myth uh, of the society. But it is a myth because the inequality, like in the US, the inequalities got worse over the last two decades, which is part of why they introduced affirmative action after all these years. When you see the black population losing ground educationally steadily, you gotta go, okay, <laughs> only one way to go at this. <laughs> and that's kind of head on. So for me, I see the distinct, and I see in a particular, you have a big living model of it in Brazil, uh, where there's lots of fluidity and movement in who people uh, interact with and may have friendships with, but huge disparities in who ends up holding resources, uh, you know, utilizing power uh, and the like. And I see those things as connected and I don't want fluidity at one end to mask rigidity on the other. Uh, and I think a consequence of really heavily engaging those would contribute to greater fluidity down here and a fluidity that was no longer masking an unhealthy dynamic in the other dimensions if that follows. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah, uh, thanks for a, a really great talk. Very, really fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested in kind of the, the biological genetic arguments that are part of uh, the post yeah. thesis. It seems like there's kind of like a mishmash of things yeah. going on there, right? Some yep. of it's about how the 
basically race is going to get bred out. And then there's other parts saying, well, there's no genetic basis to race, yeah. so we should get rid yeah. of it. So it seems like we're still kind of confused well, about what race is. Absolutely. And I think Hirschman overstates the case. And, you know, and I, my own thinking has been evolving here. I'm one of those sociologists who for years opened my race and ethnic relations class by uh, trying to get the students to define race and waiting to hear the right answer. And what's the right answer about what race is? It's socially, it's socially constructed. Well, you know, it turns out nobody outside of sociology and anthropology believes that. <laughs> and I really thought we had succeeded. But there's a beautiful book by Ann Morning uh, called uh, The Nature of Race. Is that what it is? Um, where she begins with a simpler question. She just asks people how they understand race. And she ends up finding that, lo and behold, it doesn't take two, three, four seconds before people get beyond cultural difference, da, 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 and start invoking biology, especially for black-white differences of almost um, any kind. And moreover, the more you dig into it and read, there are a cadre of serious biologists, geneticists, computational biologists who are now arguing in favor of maintaining the old five-fold racial categories, the continental racial ancestry groups. Serious people who don't have a racist project, actually. They aren't trying to oppress. They're just arguing that in terms of certain uh, uh, health outcomes and susceptibility to various illnesses, that race is sufficiently close to being real that we actually have to recognize it and deal with it. And, more, it's, and you see it in terms of some things that are supposed to be beneficial, like race-targeted pharmaceuticals and drugs. So a, a drug like Bidil being patented as the black high blood pressure um, uh, medication. So that even as we are all teaching all of you <laughs> that race is social, there are other people working on a totally different project, moving in a totally different direction. And it is just wrong to think that we have accomplished an influential consensus that's now changed what's going on in these other, it's not the case. Uh, and to an astonishing degree, there are scientists once again defending this notion of race, but actually saying um, we've got evidence for it and it's got a positive societal benefit when we recognize it. And even people on the left sometimes appropriate that. I don't know if you remember a decade or so ago, Ward Connolly in California tried to pass a state initiative forbidding the state to collect any data on race, to, use, to more in effect use the term race, and which again was part of his anti-affirmative action project in a way that we aren't even going to let you count <laughs> where people are or, or who they are. And what did the left do to try to defeat it? Do you remember the message? The message that worked was they decided to get white voters to vote against this by going, it will undermine the quality of your health care if doctors can't designate race on these forms. That's what they did. <laughs> um, so we're still fighting, but, but this is part of why I think the idea of not having a positive race project is a very dangerous context to be in. If you don't articulate the positive way of engaging this, negative things happen. And the last example of that I give is when we created the Mark More Than One movement, the parents who went in and pushed for that, who were primarily the white mothers of mixed race kids, were the, they were the main political force behind this, but they hadn't thought beyond identity politics. They wanted to be acknowledged and they didn't want their kids to face pressure to choose between mommy or daddy when they filled out a form. They wanted a way they could recognize both. But because they hadn't thought through what it meant to be part of a racial project, who ends up being their main opponents? The traditional liberal civil rights community are their main antagonists who are defending the traditional race categories, which have consequences for voter representation, monetary allocations of various kinds. And who ended up being their main ally? Newt Gingrich. These people who thought they were pursuing, but hadn't thought through it at all, a positive race, end up as their ally, Newt Gingrich and the Republican right. Um, so <laughs> I think it helps to be explicitly mindful of this. And one of the challenge, both practically and for intellectuals now, and I'll stop there, is how do you articulate a continuing engagement with race and racial categories and even racial identities and do it in a way that is 
politically progressive. That doesn't end up embracing negative essentialism and authenticity claims uh, and solidaristic claims that are divisive. I think it's possible to do that, but we haven't devoted nearly the level of thought, inquiry, uh, and discourse to that that we have on lots of other questions uh, in this arena. But that's where I would go. I think that's an important call to action to end on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.